two points on this list. I jump into the note material and look at the so-called uh, worked through example, uh, just to recap everything with you. Um, and then we spend five, ten minutes at the end on a little Socrative quiz that I prepared for you this time. I think we have the time for that. So look forward to that. Post hoc, exactly like last time. When we get the result from the overall F test, that's an overall test, testing are the TVs different or not? Yes, they were. Are the persons different or not? Yes, they were. Then subsequently, it's usually relevant to dig into more detail, to do the analysis and summary of the actual differences between the different uh, treatment levels. And not only saying somewhere something is different, that's not enough to tell the story. You need to do the actual, sort of dig into the details and tell the story. That is usually within the ANOVA framework called post hoc analysis. We can do confidence intervals for pairwise comparisons and we can do hypothesis testing. We can do it across treatments and we can do it across blocks. There is an important note here that if you sort of scroll through your chapter on two-way analysis, you will not find method boxes that tells you how to do post hoc. They are not there. But you will find a sentence somewhere that tells you, go look at the method boxes from the one-way chapter and use that method box because it's the same thing, right? With a little teeny weeny twist that the way you should use the one way post hoc method box when you are in the two way situation is that of course first of all you should use the name is the same but of course the computation is a little different you should use the mean so the sum of squares and the mean squares for the residuals coming from the two way of course and accordingly, also the proper degrees of freedom in those formulas. So not MSE from one way and N minus K from one way, but MSE from two way and degrees of freedom from two way. If you do that substitution, the method boxes and everything on post hoc from one way can be copied in the two way setting, right? That's the way to go about it. Doesn't mean I haven't taught you how to do it if you scroll through. You just have to find that sentence that tells you how to copy it from one way, right? And the new thing is you can compare treatments or you can compare blocks in the similar way. It goes the same way. For instance, like this, right? Here is the one way formula and then you would, uh, actually this is uh, rubbish. Huh? Of course, I should, I didn't even manage to substitute that here. I should substitute the degrees of freedom when I put it like that uh, to get the right formula here. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an odd mix of something not right. Uh, so I did a mistake myself. So we can do pairwise confidence intervals with the same, just to emphasize again, I'll make a correction of that little thing because that's a, a bit of an annoying typo, of course. Uh, so I'll, I'll change that in, and, and update it. Um, that is, again, like last time, if we do pre-planned comparisons. This is this odd thing about the pre-planned versus just doing all of them uh, jointly, right? We still have to think about that. If we just compare everything, blah, 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 all combinations, for the eight assessors, there would be eight times seven divided by two. That's 28 comparisons. That's a pretty high number of comparisons. And there will be a high risk that just by chance, one out of 28 might come out significant, at least if I test on 5% level each time. And that's the, then the rule. If I am going to do this comparing everything without having any pre-focused plan in mind, if I just compare everything, that's the last comment here, I should 
not use 5% in each of those 28 comparisons. I should use 5 divided by 28%, right? A much stricter criterion, making it more difficult to claim that uh, levels are different from each other. That's the right way. So either one. It's not prohibited to do the first one if it's really something that you had in mind in the beginning. But you know, this is, of course, as I discussed last time, this is where we hit a gray zone area, right? <laughs> because it's very easy for people if they do research, at least. And I, mean, I mean, in business, I think people are less prone to do such ridiculous mistakes because people in business, they know that making stupid things um, will uh, make money disappear, right? <laughs> so people in business, they are usually pretty skilled. People in research, they might be more prone because the way research works. I don't know if you ever thought about that. What you do in research is you spend a lot of time to apply for money, and then if you're successful, you get money uh, because you did a nice uh, project application, a description of what fantastic findings you're probably going to uh, get out of this money. Then you do the experiment, and oh my god, these results are not significant. Now I got five millions and I get non-significant results. That's what Milena Penkova really thought. Let's, uh, let's do something about it then. Right. One of the things you can do, which is uh, not as uh, bad as she apparently did, uh, I know she was convicted, but I think she also was called uh, Anke, what's the English word for Anke? Re, um, wanted to have it re-evaluated. Uh, uh, anyone who knows the de English word for Anke? Oh, sorry? Appeal, thank you. So she appealed, uh, as I, far as I remember, she appealed. So uh, I mean, it's gonna maybe have another round. For those of you not from Denmark, Milena Penkova is a pretty famous uh, fraud researcher in Denmark, yeah. Or at least convicted to be fraud researcher so far. Um, but there are gray zone areas of fraud <laughs> before you go. One of those gray zone areas is Hey, I tested 10 different conditions. Now I see that the condition two and five, which were the smaller and the bigger one, those two are different from each other. Hey, I'm pretty sure that I meant to compare two and five with each other. I'm sure I had that in some email somewhere. Uh, so yes, indeed, I wanted to compare two and five. So I compare two and five by the 5% level. And hey, I get a significant result. I'm worth my five million, I'm not getting sacked, and I'll get more millions, right? That's, that's problematic, right? Because you did not compare two specific ones, you compared the smaller and the bigger one among 10, right? So you made 10 and then you made selections, the smaller and the bigger. You need to take that selection into your p-value computation. That can be done. There are other ways, uh, like the Bonferroni, but it's a similar thing. You could take that into account and say, hey, if I'm going to claim they're different, those two specifically, I should at least document that when I compare 10 and pick out the smaller and the bigger one, then my difference is still larger than it would be by chance. I need to have that selection procedure into my p-value consideration. If you do that, then fine. But if you don't, you're on the Penkova path, right? Many people are on Penkova paths unknowingly. That's why there is a room for people like us. Think about it, the 29 different results we had in the beginning on the Balotelli case with the red cards, right? 29 different results. All of us thought we did the right thing. Hey. Yeah. We can also do hypothesis testing. And in my expression of the hypothesis test, now I use the MSE, which then is the right thing, because then I don't actually write out the degrees of freedom, but I assume that I divide it by the right thing. Um, and that's the same thing, either pre-planned or multiple. That's basically the, the post hoc. 